Hi everyone, I'm Martin and welcome to MP Astro. Now, at the moment, through all the past few months, it's not been particularly great for astronomy. One, the weather, and two, the current situation we're all in at the moment, which I cannot address on this video. However, I've noticed that over the past few months, sales for all the astronomical telescopes that from the retailers is declining really really fast and I've noticed that it's very hard now to purchase a brand new telescope for Christmas and uh, it is increasingly getting difficult to ordering these items. Retailers are struggling uh, due obviously through these difficult times now at the moment I've noticed a lot of items brand new are out of stock and it's affected the whole ashram community. Now bear in mind despite the harsh times there are alternatives and if you're looking for a telescope or you're looking for something there's always something out there that you can get. And there is one key factor I would consider. If you're struggling to buy a telescope for Christmas or for your kids and all that, have a look at going something, uh, go second hand. Now believe it or not, second hand market, if you check out eBay uh, or any second hand uh, websites, there are a few that I will provide in the links all right, below on this video. All right, so you check out the description. I highlight some second-hand shops and retailers where you could find alternatives. And believe it or not, a lot of this equipment, despite being second-hand, you can find some really good telescopes within a budget for not much money you just got to have a keen eye do a little bit of research and have a look what's what's out there and believe me you can find really good equipment for not much money without breaking the bank and I know it is pretty harsh at the moment but it's the best way I would suggest if you're struggling to buy a brand new telescope or whatever means there are retailers all doing second-hand items as well so please check them out now to be honest here with this video I'd like to share is I've always wanted this item it was one of my wish lists and it proves the point that buying second-hand is the way to go at the moment now this telescope I've always wanted it it's just my ultimate dreams to own this particular telescope before we start the video again if you're not subscribed onto my channel again subscribe onto my channel and again if you like this video hit a like button and hitting the like button will just push out this video out more and also please share this video and um, for videos like this, I just want to share uh, my adventures and my reviews on certain equipment that I, uh, I test out and show you guys and girls uh, what you can do out there. So you can look at these videos, do your research and you can go ahead and make purchases safely. So if you're interested in what I've got, and you want to find out more about this telescope so please follow me through this adventure and let's do this so here it is my new telescope it's just arrived today uh, I bought this second hand comes with its original box I purchased this item from ENS Optical. It's a very good second-hand retailer that deals with second-hand telescope equipment. 
Again, if you're interested to purchase um, from ENS Optical, check out the link below. And in there, the, the link below in the description, uh, they have a variety of second hand telescopes. Now, I have been scanning through the website quite a lot and I picked up this for a fantastic deal. £600 is pretty impressive stuff. The only drama I have with this telescope is it's missing the eyepieces and it's missing a diagonal mirror. That's the only drama I have. Um, but I'm not really concerned about those items because one, I've got a better diagonal mirror and I've got better two inch eyepieces. So I'm not really fussed about it. This telescope does not come with a great diagonal mirror anyway. And the eyepiece is only just to get you started. So I'm not really concerned about uh, what it has because I've already got eyepieces and I've already got a mirror diagonal. So I'm going to open this box and I'll tell you what it is that I've got. Very big box for its size. This will probably be the box with the 50mm finder scope, but we'll, I'm not going to go too much in detail until later on. Very well packaged, foam blind. And then here it is the dream telescope that I've always wanted. Oh my god. The telescope tube weighs 8 kilograms. And here it is. This is in mint condition. Not even a scratch. The only thing is, it's got a bit of markings on the dovetail. That is it. But I'm not really concerned about the dovetail. What I'm concerned about is this. This is the beast. This is the legendary Maxitov 180. This is a Skywatcher 180mm aperture Maxitov, also known as the Planet Killer. And as you can see, it is a compound telescope which consists of a meniscus lens that gets refracted back to a primary mirror and gets bounced back onto the secondary mirror and then gets folded back in and that will increase the fourth call length quite a bit and as you can see it's a beast all right I've got a lot of telescopes but this is the telescope that I really want and this will deliver me some outstanding planetary images and this is what I wanted all this time I've always wanted a, this telescope every every time I've seen some reviews and I finally got her I finally got her and again you must check out a lot of great deals uh, I've seen I've seen this telescope at a great price and uh, I've seen it in many good astro retailers and the best ones I've found so far to buy this brand new is uh, Rob Valley Optics, 365 Astronomy and First Light Optics. They're the same to be they're the main retailers that seem to offer uh, this telescope at a great deal. Okay, I've seen other I've seen other prices and all that, but this brand new you know, you're paying probably about 800 900 pounds for this particular model brand new this is the older model which has got the the black dovetail but i'm not really concerned about it even the new ones are coming out are exactly the same optical train same optical glass from uh, shot glass and the only difference with the new ones is that the dovetail is green but apart from that this is the older model and um, we're going to take a closer look on this telescope and so far I'm really excited about this now as you can see it's quite a huge objective lens now it's got a really good cap all right double clipped okay like so now let's take a look closely on the optics of this Maxitov now as you can see here this is an optical glass 
of BK7 glass. We've shot 99.5% high transmission coatings. As you can see there, that deep uh, green, uh, see that there, that deep green uh, hue there. Very fantastic coatings there. Now, the, the, the mirrors, okay, are cylindrical mirrors at the back. Now the, those are 94% reflective. Now the true aperture across from here is 182 millimeters, which works out at about 7.1 inch. The primary mirror at the back is, is around 203 millimeters. Okay, so it's got a huge primary mirror at the back, but uh, with the limited aperture, he steps it down, he curves it down, see. Now the secondary mirror, now the, the main advantage of this telescope. Now, like I said before, with refractors, they have no central obstruction. Now refractors are always going to be superior than any telescope for planetary viewing. Now that obstruction, you lose a lot of uh, contrast and sharpness, particularly particular if you're imaging or you're observing planets, okay? Now, this is the advantage. The secret of this telescope is that the central mirror, compared to a lot of Maxitops, like the 127, the 102, or the 150 millimeter. Now, this one is slightly different. The central mirror on this is 41 millimeters. That's how small it is. And it gives out an obstruction of 23%. That is all. So as it's going through uh, the drivetrain, as it's collecting the light, it really works out on surface area about 5%. And this is the advantage of this particular model. This is why this is called the Planet Killer, because it, this is pretty much close um, in performance of an aprochromatic refractor. Okay, I'm not just disputing this, because as we go and test this out tonight, I'll show you how good the contrast and the image quality this telescope is. Also, with the aperture, will help give out a resolving power of 0.64 doors limit so again the lower that number the more resolution a resolving power you can capture uh, looking at planets you'll see a lot more detail with this high optical glass now that central obstruction is the secret of this telescope and this is the reason why it's called the planet killer refractors are the best telescope because they have no central obstruction. This telescope has a small obstruction which will not be as good as an aprochromatic refractor all right, in, in terms of sharpness but it comes very very close all right and I mean very very close. Now the tube itself is very compact. Now I obviously this is demonstration purposes. I would not mount this telescope on this AZ-3, okay? It's not sturdy enough. But this is just to show the, the dimensions, okay, of this telescope, and it's, it is compact. Now the tube weighs 7.8 kilograms, which is almost eight kilograms in weight. Again, this telescope has a very long focal length of, two, of 2,700, millimeters focal length and the focal ratio is at f15 now the tube is only literally half a meter which is around about 500 millimeters long all right so and the width okay is 216 millimeters so it's not a bad uh, size it's quite compact for its size don't, don't get me wrong, there are bigger telescopes, a lot more bulky than this, but this can quite handle um, a decent medium sized mount, but it has to be a good mount. Now, the 9 50 finder 
is okay. It's got reasonably good optics, all right, just coated optics, and it's and it's supported by a fireoscope dovetail, okay. And quite, it is quite sturdy, and uh, it is got an upright erecting prism, and it's either a prism or a uh, mirror. I'm not quite sure, but it gives out an upright image. Unfortunately, it gives you a back to front uh, sideways motion. When you look at the stars, they seem to be back to front. That's only a disadvantage of that. Now the clamp's pretty good. I'm not particularly fond with the the plastic um, lock screws. Okay, don't get me wrong. The finder scope is is pretty good if you want to look for deep sky objects and all that because it's got enough aperture for that. And uh, it does put on a bit of weight, it's, it's probably around about 500-600 grams added on to the main optical tube. Also with this finder scope, uh, it has built-in crosshairs as well, right? That's, that will help you be able to point the telescope tube onto your target. So the crosshairs are built in with this uh, finder scope as well, all right? So, it's not a bad finder scope. If you want to upgrade for something better, you can do, but to honest with it, it's all right. It's not brilliant. And the adjustment screws can be a bit fiddly, okay? To get it centered into the field of view. Because this telescope has a narrow field of view, um, this helps massively, but the adjustment screws are not brilliant, all right, on this telescope. But apart from that, it is usable. Once it's adjusted, it can actually hold uh, the adjustment for quite some time, all right? But time after time, you, you may have to adjust the finder scope, all right, making sure, because it does throw off uh, its alignment with the main scope. Now there's one thing I need to highlight as well with this compact tube. The uh, the good thing, a nice little feature, right? With this finder scope, you can mount the bracket. You can take it up on here, all right? This bracket, you can mount it on this side. And these screws here, you can change the, the bracket over to one side to the other, all right? So you can have it on the left hand side or the right hand side. So I do like how this optical tube, how Skywatcher have designed uh, so that you can locate another um, dovetail for a finder scope. This is particularly useful because you can actually um, attach a, a finder scope bracket here and you can actually fit a guide scope if you wish. So there's options there, all right, it's a pretty good idea. And you, it's quite simple, you take these Phillips screws off and then you just take off this uh, bracket here and you can put it on that side if you wish. But it's not bad, it's, it's, a, it's, good. it's a good little feature. I just thought I'd highlight that, all right? On the other brands uh, of the other Maxitovs, they don't have that feature, okay? So that's something to bear in mind with this. So now we're at the back end of the telescope, all right? Now, as you can see here, there's quite a lot of features here. Now, for starters, you do get a scat threaded or a Schmidt threaded um, eyepiece, two inch eyepiece holder. Now, usually with a standard kit, uh, I'm missing the inch and a quarter adapter, because usually what you find is you get the inch and a quarter adapter, which, which will fit in here. But as you can see, I've just got an alternative Alto Astro inch and a quarter self-centering adapter anyway, all right? But you can fit inch and a quarter eyepieces, or you can fit a uh, two inch eyepieces in there, all right? Now the extension tube is around about 60 millimeter extension, okay, overall. Something I do not like, and I don't know what it is, but some people might like it, is if you look inside here, there is no brass fitting, all right? It's just standard, uh, standard M4 screw uh, bolts. The disadvantage of that is because there's no brass uh, fitment inside here, all right, this standard eyepiece holder will mark your diagonal or your eyepieces, all right, and I'm not a big lover of that. So 
I will be replacing this item for a telescope uh, telescope service variant which has a brass fitting in there and again I provide the link at the bottom all right so that you know uh, uh, you can get this item now the other thing is it's got a focus wheel it's quite smooth however I would like to have seen like a 10 to 1 focuser here but it's not bad it is pretty coarse uh, but the focuser just moves the uh, actual primary mirror back and forth right that, that's what focus that's what that focuser does it moves the primary mirror up and down it's not bad however I'll be looking at something uh, to improve on that I mean I would like to have seen a 10 to 1 focuser where you can adjust the, the, the part of it and then you can adjust uh, minutes of it. So, and this will cause problems if you're trying to fine tune planets, like if you want to try and focus Jupiter or Saturn and you want to get a really good sharp image, the, the focus is a bit coarse, all right? It's not brilliant, but you can work with it. But I will find another way to make this better. Now the other thing, like if you've seen me in my last video, this was a really old video, this was probably about five or six years ago. Uh, I did a video on collimating the Skywatcher 127 Mac. Again, as you can see here, you see these screws here. Now these are the main screws that hold the, the, the primary mirror all right, at the back. All right, and usually these usually hold collimation really well, okay? And to be honest with you, I will only touch these on a neat basis if I'm focusing on a star and uh, all the rings around that star, if, if I put it out of focus, um, if, if, all, if all those little circles on the out of focus star is not quite right or central, then these are the adjustments to adjust the uh, primary mirror. And again, these big ones are the the lockdown bolts that that locks the mirror, all right. And these smaller ones, when you're adjusting the the primary mirror, you're meant to slacken the big ones, and these smaller ones, which are Allen bolts, all right, or Allen screws, you just basically just slacken and adjust each one to then collimate your primary mirror. But again, please check out the uh, the old video from the Skywatcher 127. It is the exact same process as this 127 Mac, all right? It's virtually the same. But again, I do not recommend that you start tampering with these bolts and screws because you're gonna throw off your collimation. You only touch these as a need basis. In other words, if the stars if you adjust the stars out of focus, you will see that with the, the integral circles. And if they're not center all the way to the middle of that star, then that's when this is required. One key, there's one recommendation I would advise is because it's a closed tube design, if you're taking this telescope and you're setting it outside, right moisture will get inside here okay and when you're taking it out from a cold environment you need to dry out the optics so you put this telescope in a warm room with the dust caps off allow the um, meniscus lens to evaporate and then dry out now again get yourself a desiccant cap like this all right this is quite an expensive one but you can you can make a desiccant cap, all right. And I've done a video on that. But you can also buy these as well from a lot of good Astro retailers, all right. And they have like little desiccant beads inside, all right. And what this device does, all right, is as you are not using the telescope and you want to dry out the optics, it has little vents here where you can just clamp into the eyepiece holder, like so. And then you just allow the telescope to dry out. And what this does, it will take out all the moisture 
from the inside of the optical tube, all right, and it would withdraw all the moisture or dew or whatever. If you don't dry this out using those desiccant caps, what will happen is all that trapped moisture will start to settle within the lens elements or the mirror assemblies and it will start to um, get trapped in between there and it will cause fungus growing in into the optics and you don't want that all right if fungus starts forming it will start damaging the coatings and then it will require some very specialist cleaning or repair which you cannot do now over the years I've got my 127 Mac and I've always used a desiccant cap all right and ever since I've been using it I've not had any dramas with any fungus right and I've that telescope that I own now is around about seven years and it still looks brand new all right and just for a simple device like this will save you thousands and thousands of pounds all right of damage all right this is just a simple and easy trick and all it does is once uh, once it they all change color it means all the moisture is expleted all those desiccant beads and you just have to recharge them and again please refer to the video below that I highlight a discount cap where you can actually make it yourself again nowadays if you've got a 3d printer you can actually make these all right and again you can make these for not much money all right and uh, you can just make your own as you can see here it's just a vixen dovetail bar and it's almost like it's almost like 10 inches long now the disadvantage of this vixen bar i would like to have seen if they made it in a lost mandy style dovetail the vixen is okay but the main problem is though it, when you start using cheap amounts with a um, like a basic bolt on the bolts tend to dig into the vixen dovetail all right, and it starts marking it. Now, as you can see here, if you see this on your second-hand telescope, do not worry about it, okay? All right, you can still use the um, the telescope, all right, you can still clamp it. This, however, don't worry about it. If you see this on your telescope, all right, as long as the dovetail is not bent or broken, all right, this is pretty normal, okay? You can buy a, a secondary dovetail to mount onto that one, all right, so you prevent further damage on, on here. But again, do not worry about that. This is standard practice with cheap Vixen dovetails. Don't get me wrong, the dovetail is okay. It does clamp on the telescope mount and the tube is pretty secure. However, I would like to have seen a better Vixen dovetail or maybe a better uh, lost Mandy one because a lost Mandy is a lot wider and a lot, a lot more suitable for this type of telescope tube Vixens are okay Which I feel are okay up to four inch tubes, but on a tube which is 7.1 inch is a bit obsessive and to this day even the new sky watchers um, even this new sky watcher maxi tops have still got the uh, a Vixen dovetail but again, instead of being black, it's green instead. All right, but uh, for such a reason, Skywatcher uh, continue to just use the Vixen ones. So, like always, with a lot of Maxitobs, or Shimmick Casa Greens for that matter, if you're gonna buy this type of telescope, I highly recommend the first thing you will buy before you even start using the telescope is get yourself one of these now as you can see here this is a a dew shield from AstroZap and again this is specially made for this telescope you can get them with a dew band heater in there which costs a little bit more money but for this one this is costing me around about 30 pounds 30 to 40 pounds all right and this will just wrap around the main telescope tube like so all right 
very simple device right you can make one yourself but to be honest with you they don't last very long if you're going to make it out of cardboard but this one will last for many many years all right and i've not had any dramas all right and it just wraps on there like so very simple and, it, and it's very secure and what that does is as you're using the telescope it keeps the dew off the meniscus lens all right and you be able to observe for longer and if you didn't have this i guarantee you now the first thing as soon as the optics have cooled down if if it's a very dewy night you will get moisture on that lens quicker than you can say with a blink of an eye this telescope i'm afraid is a dew magnet it just some sort of reason because of the, the way it's designed it moisture just gets on there so with this device here with this dew shield you'll be able to protect the optics from dewing up and it's not going to ruin your on your night's observing this also protects as a, um, a light shroud so it will help to boost contrast and it will stop stray light from entering uh, the lens all right particularly if you're wanting to image with this telescope but apart from that number one accessory if you've got this type of telescope or a Schmidt Cassegrain this would be the the number one accessory to buy all right it's a must believe me now like always Magstoff are fantastic for planetary images now if you live in an area where the planets are very low in the sky and that's usually found when you're higher if you live in an area with higher latitudes you know especially if you live at 50 degrees plus you'll find that a lot of planets are very low in the sky and uh, they're usually sometimes just above the horizon now a fantastic upgrade that you can get is this now this is a zoo ADC corrector now this will enable you to observe planets at low altitude and this will be a fantastic upgrade for this telescope okay I have featured this in a review so please check out the video above okay at the top uh, I actually done this review on this ADC, ADC corrector. It, all it is is a, is a specialized prism corrector and it just slots in into, into the focuser. All right. And again, I'm not going to go too deep into this accessory, but this will super tune uh, the Maxitoff and you'll get much better uh, image quality particularly around planets this prism will also correct the false colouring alright and it will readjust and correct all the light waves to a single to a single plane okay and this will help maximize the contrast and the sharpness even more alright because like you say with the atmosphere with the atmosphere it does actually affect the, uh, the the planetary contrast and the sharpness all right usually it's not the telescope the telescope corrects a lot of that correction but the atmosphere does cause some weird effects on planets okay particularly like Jupiter or Mars for example also with the telescope being quite portable I've I'd like to share this idea now, because I've got the original box, if you buy a telescope, keep the original boxes because some of the boxes will help act like a um, like a, an alternative case. Now, as you can see here, I've got a soft uh, geo-optic bag. Now, this bag is to fit a reflector, all right, which is I can take this with my eight-inch quattro, for example. Now you can buy this from Rover Valley Optics from, and uh, there are a Geo Optic dealer 
all right you can buy these for not much money all right and what I've done here I've kept one of the inserts of the original boxes and uh, what that does is I can place the telescope tube like so and it just fits nice and snugly okay um, it's not a, a permanent fixture but here it sits nice and comfortable okay and it's not going to rotate out and again this this bag is to fit is designed to fit reflectors of around 800 uh, millimeters vertical length all right so the 8 inch quattro all right will fit nice and perfectly but again this is a little bit shorter than the 8 inch quattro all right still bulky but it's still compact but this is more than adequate all right and it just gives it a bit more uh, stability all right and I can just zip it up like that all right and just carry it on like so so the bag again I've not seen many bags uh, made for this type of telescope but again if you've got the original box keep the inserts because those inserts will help you um, store the telescope safely all right and this is one example that I use all right and it, I can carry the telescope without no problems all right however I would like to see a case but there's nothing stopping you making your own cases all right to build your own case and do it that way so this is it guys and girls we're ready to test this planet killer now as you can see from the setup this is a huge telescope all right do not let this deceive you right when you look at the pictures and you're trying to purchase a telescope this is one big beast and um, I know it's on an EQ5 mount which is not an ideal uh, mount to mount this particular size telescope however with my EQ5 mount that's been super tuned hopefully it will perform as it should all right I mean this is at to the maximum limit of this mount and this mount's designed to lift around about 9 kilogram to about 10 kilogram of weight so I'm really up to the limit so if you're going to purchase this Maxitov from Skywatcher I mean this tube is 8 kilograms in weight and that's just the tube that doesn't include the finder scope uh, the 2 inch eyepieces and diagonal and then you got to name all your cameras as well you're going to fit all that into consideration is going to add weight to your mount so with this setup alone this mount is okay for visual use and maybe some planetary and uh, taking lunar shots but if you're taking deep sky objects I reckon you are pushing the limit on this mount regardless if it's super tuned as you can see here again if you've not seen my video on the super tuned series of the EQ5 mount please check out the link at the top so one important key aspect is what we're going to do so what we're going to do with this setup is we're going to try and image the moon and we're going to image Venus the devices that I'm going to use is I'm going to use the trusty Zoo ASR 120MC which is the colour format camera again this is a fantastic planetary camera and it's because it's USB free I'm going to maximise as much frames per second I can possibly can to capture uh, that light on Venus and the moon and again this camera is all about capturing that loads and loads of frames through that sensor once you collect that much data in there you're basically combating straight through the atmospheric uh, conditions so at any moments of where the earth is steady this where this camera will win big during that moments of when the scene gets steady and this is where this can this camera has the advantage again it's only a budget style uh, dedicated planetary camera it can be used for deep sky objects now the one thing I do like to highlight is with this telescope and I get a lot of people 
keep asking me that this telescope is not so great on cooling now let me just literate this myth when you're setting up your mount and your accessories and your camera and all that while you're doing all this it's going to take you about an hour already for the optics to cool and I don't know why there's a few people that say Maxitov are, are, are a nightmare for cooling now where I see it it's totally untrue now yes it's a closed tube variety and they do take a lot of time to cool down but when you're setting up and everything else when you're setting up the mount and you've got it you know exactly what you want you've just smashed out an hour already and then a couple of, couple of hours we'll wait till it's dark it's already cooled down and it's ready for use when I get to um, close enough when it gets dark enough I will remove the dust cap okay so I will remove the dust cap obviously I've got a lot of seagulls flying around and believe it or not I don't want to risk having bird poo on my telescope and believe me that has actually happened so what I do is I wait till the twilight hopefully there'll be no of these seagulls around and hopefully I can remove the dust cap and allow a lot more thermal cooling on on the uh, meniscus lens but again it doesn't really matter as long as the tube the optical tube is sat outside it will slowly cool down that mirror and the lens system all right and what's that going to do is once it's cold enough and it's it's adapted to within the surrounding area all right the temperature on the on the actual uh, system will be a lot steady in other words when you're looking at a planet or the moon or anything else you'll not get as much of the shimmering effect okay so again we're gonna wait till it gets dark uh, hopefully the seagulls will um, bugger off so I can remove the uh, dust cap safely and uh, wish me luck and let's do this So, guys and girls, it's a bit light, it's not quite dark, but we've got the Maxitov 180 on the moon, and we've only just done a rough pull alignment, and we're only just tracking the moon, right, in lunar tracking. And as you can see, through the DSLR camera, we've, we've got the moon surface, but it's quite large, so I am to like, surface so I'm gonna sur uh, move around all the way around the uh, the mount and as you can see there is absolutely fantastic detail there and don't forget this is almost the super moon phase but look at the detail we can just see some craters around the corner there and that's impressive like that resolution is very resolved and don't forget we've got this mount we've got this mount um, so as you can see there we've we've got the optics fully cooled down and as you can just see on the edge there that is unbelievable to resolve that kind of detail around the edge that is really impressive and don't forget this is not a bar load image this is directly from the DSLR camera and I'm just using the mount to slew across all the way around but there, there is a ton of detail there absolute ton of detail but 
If I'm using the eyepiece, if I'm using the 26 millimeter eyepiece, which is 70 degree, I can get the whole field of view 104 times with this telescope. But wow, that is really impressive. I love the detail on that. It's very sharp and very crisp. Wow, we just got Venus through that Mach 180 and this is probably one of the best images of Venus I've ever seen in my entire life. And look at the detail, I can even see the, uh, the shadow on the, on the uh, actual crescent as well. That is unbelievable. Because it's too low, it's shimming like, um, like no tomorrow. So I need to get this in the centre and quickly catch some uh, images because I'm going to lose her. So uh, I'm going to get her in the centre field of view. Once I get in there, that's it. We're in there. I need to start capturing some data because I'm going to lose this big time. So I'm going to quickly do a quick time limit. I think two minutes will do and we're gonna do this uh, get the resolution to a bit higher let's get some more detail that's it and we're gonna take the shots now because I'm slowly running out of time before it gets too low so start the capture two minutes here we go right I'm taking the data now I'm, I'm hoping that's just captured that it's only taking oh don't do this to me I don't want to get any uh, flaws with this I want AVI files Okay. Need to start getting this. Or we're gonna lose it. So come on then, two minutes. We get two minutes of good data in there. Two minutes will give me probably about four gigabyte of, of da uh, data I've captured. But look at that. I've never seen anything like it and this is very low on the horizon. Um incredibly uh, unsteady because it's very low on the horizon and I'm not even using the uh, ADC which is the atmospheric dispersion corrector but looking at the detail there that is pretty impressive I've never seen Venus like this in all its glory and so because it, it's so low on the horizon I mean I can only get this quite low um, which is pretty sh pretty bad really because I really want it a lot higher than this in the sky to get a much better image but to be honest with you this is very impressive I'm just capturing a little bit of that data I'm capturing through that thick atmosphere even though the telescope is cooled down it just shows you when planets are very low in the sky this is what happens but look at that man I've got a lot of data there two minutes will give me some good give me a good uh, good amount of data there and this is through the zoo camera this is the zoo ISI 120 no ball lens all right there's no ball lens on this and look I mean I'm, I'm so surprised to get a very close image of Venus there but to me so this is probably my first time to actually get Venus as a crescent because usually it's quite hard to get Venus in crescent phase so I've captured the data there I'm just going to refocus the image see if I can get a better focus image and it's got worse so I'll just refocus it again
Yeah, it's getting really bad. Yeah. I think it's getting worse now. I don't I managed to get some data there. Not a lot. It's not the best image. But it's not bad. I'll capture a bit more to a last another two minutes on there and then call it quits. But I'm really happy with the results there. And uh, to say that planet is very low in the sky, it's literally about three or four degrees above the horizon. But that is impressive, really is. And that Maxitov 180, I can understand now why they call this the planet killer. It speaks for itself, even with this image. I mean, this is truly fantastic. It's a shame that my tracking isn't great. But to be honest with you, it's not too bad. I am using the full size, uh, using the full size frame as well, which might not help either. But because that object is all over the place, uh, I'll probably be best with a wise field of view.
very, very impressive telescope. And I must admit, looking at those images, it is absolutely amazing. This telescope, I can understand why people highly regard this telescope as a planet killer. Even with this telescope being used for visual purposes, even looking at that huge amounts of detail produced from this aperture of this telescope was absolutely outstanding. And being, being this 180 uh, millimeter aperture telescope with a long focal length, with that central obstruction, the optics are so so close to a triplet, all right, really, really close to a triplet refractor. And I'm actually amazed on how much I could see with this telescope. So as a planetary, as a planetary telescope, I would highly recommend this telescope without a doubt. I have used this telescope for looking at deep sky objects. Fantastic at looking at globular clusters and planetary nebula and maybe some of the smaller deep sky objects like galaxies. You can view those objects through this particular telescope. Because of the long focal length, it does tend to have the objects just a little bit dimmer. However, with the added aperture of that 180 millimeter, you can just resolve a lot of detail, particularly the globular clusters, where you can re resolve a lot of detail right towards the center of those objects. You know, you'll see thousands and thousands of stars right into the center of the core of globular clusters. And they were literally, just using a 26 millimeter eyepiece, I can resolve all that detail through, through my two inch eyepieces. And they're absolutely amazing, all right? They're breathtaking through this telescope. However, for deep sky, because it's long focal length, I wouldn't recommend this telescope for astrophotography. Because it's narrow field of view, this telescope is really designed for planetary use and looking at lunar work. So observing deep sky, not a problem, but taking pictures can be a bit of a problem because you've got this long focal length, which means it's a hellishly long, um, slower telescope with a slower focal ratio. You will be, you will need to get your mount absolutely polar aligned so that you'll be able to track the stars as accurate as possible to capture deep sky objects. Deep sky objects will be very hard to image anyway through a telescope like this. But I'm not saying it's impossible, it is possible to do it. However, it will take longer timed exposures to get a, a really sort of a decent image. So like if I'm looking at M57, I would use a refractor with a, or a reflector of something like an F6 and below. With this beast, it's got an extremely long vertical ratio. And you'll probably need, just to get N57 barely visible into the air, into the camera, you would need um, to uh, take more time, two minutes or five minutes exposure to get a decent sort of image through this telescope. Now, would I recommend this telescope? Yes and no. No, we start off is if you want to buy a telescope and you want it for all round use, this would not be a telescope that I would recommend to beginners. However, because this telescope is a bit of a trick pony, this, this instrument, is mostly a, of a niche type of telescope. So if you want an ultimate planetary telescope, this is a telescope I would highly recommend 
for the planetary users. So if you like to take pictures of planets or the moon or whatever, this telescope is absolutely fantastic for the money. And I would recommend uh, this telescope four and a half stars. And the reasons why I want to get it four and a half stars is there are improvements that need to be made on this telescope. Again, I would like to see a better dovetail and the visual back needs to be improved. That's the only reason why I rewarded it four and a half stars. So if you want a planetary telescope where you want the 3D effect on looking on those planets like Jupiter and Saturn and you name it, this telescope will resolve that kind of power. You'll see a ton of detail without a doubt and I guarantee you now, I'm absolutely amazed on this equipment. Absolutely, completely amazed on the sheer image quality of what this telescope has produced. So, that concludes my video of this product review on this Maxitov. Please hit a like button. If you like watching my video, please hit a like button. And again, if you just visited my channel, please subscribe to my channel. Also, share this video. You know, there's not many reviews on this telescope in particular. And again, please share it out because to answer, this will help a lot of people choose what they want to buy. And if you're into planets and you like to take images of planets, now this telescope will be absolutely the perfect companion for you. And again, I will publish a lot more videos. So again, please hit, please hit the bell and you'll get notified for any videos that I publish out soon. So to that on, I wish to say thanks again. Thanks for watching. Remember to keep safe everyone. And I wish you all clear skies.